Welcome to the Corner Kick Extra, second version of the Corner Kick Extra. Here we go, JJ, as we start the new year. Uh, it's time to talk soccer more than Mondays. How are you doing today? Doing all right. A little cold for Friday, but you get through because tomorrow's Saturday. <laughs> That's always a good thing, and it's a super soccer Saturday. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's quite a few big games. We'll talk about Chelsea Arsenal uh, a little later on in our, our program today. Obviously, that is the marquee match of the weekend, specifically given Liverpool's inability to finish the job. Um, we'll talk again a little bit about the Liverpool match. I have some thoughts. Got to, to sit down and watch that. Want to want to talk about that. Want to talk about the championship uh, a little bit later on uh, in the show. And also uh, Leipzig Dortmund coming up uh, this weekend. But let's yeah. start here in the United States. Um, the biggest piece of news that broke stateside this week has been the announcement of the potential Major League Soccer expansion bids. Yeah, it was, uh, it was an interesting Tuesday when, uh, when they were all due. And, uh, you know, like everything else, you always get one, one surprise. Um, previously, MLS had basically announced all the teams that were going to, or all the cities that were going to be bidding. Uh, it was up to 10. Phoenix got added late. And then um, at the, you know, the 90th minute there, Indianapolis uh, submitted a bid through Indy 11. So um, a little bit of a surprise there. Um, and then some drama the day after when people started seeing the Sacramento bid in the details and realized that the Sacramento Republic were not mentioned anywhere within the bid itself, that um, Kevin Nagel actually changed his Twitter handle um, and took the reference from Sacramento Republic out and put in an MLS reference. Uh, then it started to come out that, well, first they were saying he was the majority owner, then he's not the majority owner, then his group and Sacramento Republic are actually not talking, and they, it turned into a mess really, really fast. If you ask me, JJ, um, that slip-up could ruin Sacramento's chances at an MLS bid. Um, it, it certainly is a ding if you, if I'm Major League Soccer's office, I'm sitting there going, wait a minute, you have this established team that the mayor is behind, that you know an NBA group is interested in being a part of, and you're not going to stick with your sold-out crowds. The reason we even considered you in the first place was, yes, you have these wealthy contacts, but you had an established brand that could simply just pop up you know you, you you have facilities in sacramento that you can play in while the mls size stadium is being built now you're going in a totally different direction you've just alienated your entire fan base mm -hmm. what happens if you split off and the republic stays around will those people say well to hell with the mls team they were here first, much like you've seen, I think, out of Detroit, where mm -hmm. this the, the bit of the rogue club in Detroit City has basically said, well, we want nothing to do with this. Uh, I definitely think that's what would happen in Sacramento. Um, they're Sacramento Republic supporters. I don't think they would be supporters of new Sacramento MLS if Sacramento Republic are still playing. Um, if they shut down and the MLS team was still separate, I think they would still lose a good portion of of that support that was built up. Uh, I, I think the bid overall was in a bit of trouble anyway with San Diego throwing their hat in the ring. Um, ever since MLS All-Star was there in, was it 97 or 98, MLS wanted to be in San Diego. Kind of like MLS always wanted to be in St. Louis. They could just never make it happen. And now that it can happen, and it looks like the pieces are all together there. I think San Diego and St. Louis are the two front runners, unless something falls through with uh, St. Louis's stadium prospects. But in the end, I think they'll get it all worked out anyway. Um, I think Sacramento was hurt by San Diego coming in. I don't see MLS going with five teams in California right now. Uh, could they? Yes. I would be surprised if they did. They're still... I think trying to spread that footprint around a little more. And I think there's one or two other areas that they might want to go into. 
um, than you know just chucking another team out in uh, in California. Well, I think California is the easy answer. It's the largest, uh, you know, the largest state. Um, you know, population wise, gosh, uh, you know, total population's got to be approaching 45, 50 million now. Um, and I think you also make a good point, though. San Diego has long since been a market that Major League Soccer has wanted to chip in. It is a little bit of a hotbed of soccer and. You know, a lot of their potential fan base, you're talking either a two-hour trek to the galaxy right now Mm -hmm. or going down into Mexico um, to go watch Tijuana. Uh, I think that they are probably at the top of the list. Um, You know, we've seen the stadium renderings. If everything falls into place there Mm -hmm. with the construction and destruction of Qualcomm, uh, and this new facility, I think it could be the most beautiful soccer stadium in the entire league, uh, just from what I've seen. I think that it would, on day one, trump anything that's out there, including Red Bull Arena, which is my favorite. But mm-hmm. um, I think they would have to be number one. I think you mentioned St. Louis as well. Um, St. Louis has to fight through some politics. I know mm-hmm. that the governor there has said, you know, I'm not sure we want to spend public funding on a soccer stadium when we have social and political issues and financial issues that we have to resolve. We have crime, we have poverty, we need to tackle that more than a soccer stadium. I think they find a way. Um, You know, politicians always look for the the next move, so I think they'll work with them. It may have to be some type of tax deferment if they're not going to legitimately pony Mm -hmm. up the cash. Maybe it's a a five-year deferment on taxes or or something along those lines or a customized rate that they'll pay. But I think that if you're looking at your first two, they have to be up there. And I think your other two front runners right now that are going to be in that mix out of the 12 – are San Antonio because the Spurs are involved Mm -hmm. and Tampa St. Pete because they seem to have the most traction um, and the idea of an Atlanta, Orlando, Tampa, Southeastern rivalry Mm -hmm. I think is exciting for Major League Soccer. I think it's good for that area. I don't think Miami Beckham is going to get off the ground. That's just me personally. Mm -hmm. We've been waiting long enough I think it's three um, years now. So I think that those are your four front runners. I think if they're going to throw an oddball, um, I would think possibly one of the Rust Belt bids would be in before I think the Carolinas. Though I think that's a that's a future market for them too. Mm-hmm. I think for Major League Soccer, if you could look at the idea of Toronto, Chicago, Indy. KC, Minnesota, all clumped together mm-hmm. like that with St. Louis. Um, those are kind of your your front runners. Mm-hmm. Indy, I like the Indy Eleven throwing their hat in the ring. They they are one of the attendance leaders in the NASL, and the concept of a short drive from Chicago, a uh, hop over from Columbus. I think MLS could be intrigued by that. Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham is. I think those are two future markets for me and as of right now there's really not a natural rivalry that MLS could create for rivalry day out of that whereas I think these other markets San Diego LA you can create something there St. Louis KC St. Louis Chicago you can kind of work that up out of it you know obviously they you know everybody a lot of the fans kind of said that with Red Bull in New York City well how can you create a rivalry when no games have ever been played but they successfully did that so I think you know and even Tampa Tampa Orlando makes sense yeah I think uh, I agree the top two I mean St. Louis and San Diego are are definites Uh, I think St. Louis will get it sorted I think you know the city is still trying to get it sorted um, if the state can just come through, even if it's not hard dollars, but like you said, just some kind of tax deferment thing or, or, or something of that effect, I think St. Louis gets done. This is the closest that they've been that I remember, uh, and I, I don't see it failing. Um, I, I do think San Antonio is going to be in the mix, uh, be, not only because of the Spurs, but they have a stadium. All they have to do is expand it. Uh, it's a lot different than having to build it from the ground up. Uh, from scratch, so you know, I think they'll be heavily involved um, w- with with all that. I just see that getting done. Um, Tampa is a good shout um, with, with Bill Edwards down there. 
Uh, Indianapolis, it's, it's interesting because when the bid, when it broke that they were going to submit a bid, uh, somebody from Indy 11 had reference that MLS asked them to bid. And then after all the bids went in, MLS said, no, we didn't ask them to bid. We were open to them bidding. So depending on how you look at that, if MLS did indeed ask them to bid, to me, that pushes them towards the front of the line. Um, their location is perfect because it's under three hours from Chicago and under three hours from Columbus. It closes that loop um, between those two because that's just a long drive between the two. So you might be able to draw a little more, like you said, in that Midwest rivalry thing. Uh, Nashville is a dark horse for me. They got on board really late. Their USL side is still a year away uh, from, from starting. Uh, the group that's pushing for MLS isn't necessarily um, married to the USL side, but they have been talking about how they can make it work, where it could be if they get the bid, somehow they buy the club, or you know, and those owners become minority owners. But I think that there would be something there. Uh, the mayor in Nashville is completely on board. She was due to MLS offices, I think, yesterday uh, to talk about how the city's behind the stadium. They already have the land. Apparently, they're going to put it at the fairgrounds, which the city owns, which the mayor says, yes, we're going to put it there. So their stadium is already, you know, 75, 80 percent of the way to all the approvals needed to put shovels in the ground that quickly. Uh, so they're a little bit out of nowhere, and they, they have some good money people there. Uh, so I think they're a bit of a dark horse. Uh, Detroit and Phoenix, for me, are just long shots. Phoenix' problem will be that there isn't going to be a team within, I think it was 400 miles from them. Um, I think this is too, just too soon for them. Uh, Detroit, I think their issue with Detroit City is, is going to come back uh, to bite them a little bit because I think they'll struggle for support because I don't see Detroit City, I think their push this year is to get 10,000 fans per game. If they're getting that, they're not going to go to an MLS side. They're going to stay where they are. Um, so that's 10,000 less soccer people that you're going to be able to draw from, and that's your hardcore base right there. So I think Detroit would have a ton of work to do. Uh, I think Carolina is actually hurt by having two separate bids. Uh, Charlotte got hurt because they didn't have, I think it was the it was the city vote that they didn't have. They had the county vote, but not the city vote, although they anticipated it will go through. Uh, the city put the brakes on it and just said it's too quick, we need to look at all the stuff more. Uh, but I just think between them and Raleigh-Durham, it, it's a bridge too far at this point. Um, the one we didn't, haven't really talked about, Cincinnati, uh, I think they would be a, a very good market as well. I think if they need their own stadium, they might struggle a little bit there because of just the way Cincinnati is. I don't think they need one, though. They, they have Nippert. They can sell beer there. Mm -hmm. So that's already taken care of. That would I don't know how that works with the college camp. I don't know if it's a grandfathered thing in Ohio, whatever it is, but there's they check all the boxes. Mm -hmm. It would all depend on MLS's view on it. And I just think that's, an, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a check against them. Uh, I think MLS wants them at some point to be in their own stadium. I think they need to have that plan. Maybe not straight away. It could be three, four years, but I don't think they want to have another New York City going on where, oh, yeah, we'll get in and then we'll find a stadium easy peasy, and they're still struggling to find a location. At least Nipper so, could pass for a soccer stadium, though. It, it could. It could. Um, nice you know, round facility. Yeah, it it, it, it looks a little better than a baseball field. It, it, oh, absolutely. Uh, I just think, think that doesn't help their cause much. I like uh, I like the the Nashville Fairgrounds location mm -hmm. though it's it's not directly in the center of Nashville say where mm -hmm. Nissan is the the football stadium yeah. but um, it's right at the confluence of the inner ring of the highway mm -hmm. and it's a neighborhood that probably could use a little shot in the arm mm -hmm. so I think it's close enough to the center of the city where I think it's it's easy to access because there's there's a couple highways around there mm -hmm. so traffic in and out probably not as bad um, and and that if that's far along, then, yeah, I think that adds them up the list a little bit. So you've got San Diego, St. Louis, San Antonio, and Tampa. And if Miami doesn't get going, who's your fifth? My fifth? Yeah. Uh, and where are we at? It's San Antonio, San Diego. St. Louis. St. Louis. We're in agreement on those and, three. And, and then I you, went with Tampa, Tampa, and then my fifth mm -hmm. 
Um, I think it's a Rust Belt team. I think it's either Indy or Cincinnati. Okay. One of those two. Um, Carolina is a possibility, but it sounds like they're having some issues with the, like you said, the the, the voting there hasn't necessarily happened yet. Raleigh Durham will be interesting because their stadium plans are going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, so there isn't a ton known what's going on down there. And if they come up with a gem, all of a sudden, you know, it's an established, you know, well, it's an NASL side. But you know, it's, it's rebranding it's and everything market. that, but they're already there, mm-hmm. um, which you know, might give them that little bit of leg up. So that'll be interesting. Um, so that's what I'll say. I'll say those four, and then if it's a fifth team, mm-hmm. it's going to, I'll say Indy or Cincinnati. Though right now I will lean towards Indianapolis. I think Tampa for me is all contingent on Miami. So for me, they're the fifth. If Miami comes in, I don't think they'll go to Tampa. Um, it's just one of those gut feelings that I have. Um, I worry if Miami can survive, though. Oh, I, I do, too. Because most of their professional sports teams are, are struggling yeah. mightily. Um, I think you you know, you know, see the Dolphins struggle, the, the, the Florida Panthers struggle, unless it's the Blackhawks, the Rangers, mm-hmm. the Devils, the Flyers, mm-hmm. you know where the population used to live, yeah. um, you know, they, they struggle. I mean, my, I've, I think we've, we've talked about this on the, the, the Monday show where, mm-hmm. I mean, my dad's been down there on business trips, and he's got courtside seats to the, to the heat, heat yeah. for $10, $15, mm-hmm. just going on stub up the day of the game because there's... Yeah, they, they had their run. When, when the team is about to win a championship, everybody goes, and then the, everybody goes back to South Beach and hangs out there you know, when the new season starts up until it gets to championship time. Um, but I, I do think that's the one that's going to keep Tampa out. So they're my fifth. For my fourth, I'm going to go with I'm going to go with Cincinnati, uh, unless North Carolina throws a gem out there. That, that's what I'm going to go with. I think I think there's going to be a surprise. Um, and, and for me, Cincinnati is a bit of a surprise because it's a little later in the game. You know, I, I'm interested to, to keep tabs on Nashville. But I will say this, I don't think this is it. I think they're going to get to 28, and they're going to go, let's get four more in here because we're going to be able to get $400 million aside and then half a billion. Um, And it's very hard to say no to those kinds of dollars. And I think that's why they're going to keep expanding um, past 28. I think they're going to go to 32, and I think that's when they're going to have the hard pause. When you've got this many cities lining up to get into your league, I mean, the last time the NFL expanded, what was it? two from four or two from five, you're going to try and pull four from 12. So I just can't see this being it. Um, and, you know, these are big money guys they got. Well, I just can't, I just don't not see this happening. And for, for me, I think of this as, as, and the older sports writers that may listen to us are going to fall out of their chairs, but this is the future. Mm-hmm. And the future is arriving. Um, you know, the days of football and baseball being the king, I think, are numbered. I think, you know, the NFL has its niche, it's the thing that mm-hmm. is, you know, there's nobody else competing with them anywhere on earth. And the, that that's its own unique animal. But MLS is a more affordable model mm-hmm. to invest in and travel with. You're, you, you can go about this in a much more affordable way. Your salary cap in Major League Soccer, if I'm a billionaire, a multi-billionaire, if I've got $5 billion, $10 billion, mm-hmm. uh, you know, theoretically, why would I want to invest in an NFL franchise where I'm going to pay out 50-something million or $60 million in salary mm-hmm. every year? I'm not sure what the... Uh, it's probably more like the, 70 the, these n- days. the numbers are. I'm going to try yeah. to actually look that up. Uh, the uh, league-wide salary, 155 million. <laughs> Double it. So really, why would I want to pay 200 million dollars? Yes, mm-hmm. the potential is there to make all this money on jersey sales and marketing and the NFL TV deal and this and that. But why would I myself, especially if I'm looking to just get in, why would I say, okay, I need to put out a billion dollars up front? To maybe to recoup it over 25 years, well, 
I can take what's the MLS? Oh, three point four million is the MLS cap, and then I can pay three guys whatever I want. I'll go down that route because my soccer stadium's going to cost me twenty five percent of what the eighty thousand seat yeah. NFL stadium is going to cost me. You know, my it's, my tickets I can price affordably where I can fill the place every game, and all I need to do is get people in the stadium. Because then they're going to buy food and buy beer and buy water and buy Coke, and that's where I make my money. And then back to it. So I, I pay $100,000, $200,000. I pay the good guys like four hundred, and I buy into this MLS company, mm-hmm. and we share the responsibilities, but we share the money at the end of this. Okay, I'll do that instead. I think what will be interesting at the end of all this is – the, the the teams that these guys that don't make it these either the the clubs beat the NASL club the USL clubs or a couple of these cities that don't have uh, a team or that aren't affiliated with the team in the city who can get those people to really invest into the team even if they're not in MLS and raise the standard of the next division you know, I think, you know, from Peter Wilt's article, he said it was 5 to $10 million entry fee. So what, NASL is about $5 million to get in, maybe 10 USL is about the same. So if you're sitting in, um, well, uh, what was uh, what one of the cities we had there that wasn't affiliated? Detroit, Phoenix. Uh, uh, Phoenix does have the club. Um, I'm trying to say Sh- Charlotte because they weren't, I don't think the owner is uh, an NASCAR guy. So I don't think he's affiliated with the Charlotte team. And if he's not, how do you say, let's get you to talk with him and let's let's get you involved with the club here and work on bringing that up you know, to standard and, and really get that going. That, I think, is just as important as anything because you can see that the second division or divisions or whatever we have by the time it's over, you could see them really jump up. Um, in quality, in value of the teams, raise the profile of the leagues. Now all of a sudden, for all of these teams that can't get in MLS because they're finally going to stop expanding, now you're going to have a home for you know the second set of guys who want to get in. And now you're saying it's not even 300 million or 250 million for it's me to get in. Million. It's 10 million or it's 20 million. Right. You know, and, and, and everything's million, different. Instead of four million on salary. I'm going to spend two million. Yeah, you know, and, and or you can be the cosmos and spend six. <laughs> yeah, right. And and you know, if you have that kind of money, you can still put out a very high quality team. I think mm-hmm. we've seen, you know, uh, the the we've watched a little of the NASL. There's a few teams here or there who can compete. Um, same thing with the USL. There's a there's there's a handful of, of sides I think that can mm-hmm. that can really compete. And then if you get that investment at that next level, like you said, you you try to stabilize mm-hmm. a little bit. Try to get these teams out of the, you know the the so, you know OKC played at a high school stadium. You know you you get out of those. Mm-hmm. You you know you, can you get Miami FC out of FIU and into something that they've built, even mm-hmm. if it's. 7,000 seats. Mm-hmm. They don't need a 31,000 seat college football stadium. Can you can you find a place to construct a 7,500 7, seat stadium? Yeah, up to 10, but something that can always get bigger just in case. Just in case, right. You know, um, and I, I'm really starting to get intrigued by the NASL here. I mean, they had three teams uh, submit bids. USL had, I think we counted five um, that were actually club affiliated, although the Sacramento thing kind of makes it four and a half. Um, I, I'm real, really intrigued because if they lose a couple of those clubs, that's going to hurt NASL a little bit. But Peter Wilt has all of a sudden become the face of that league. And I'm trying to figure out why they haven't made him the commissioner yet to go and get all this done. I believe he's still involved in, at least last I had read and heard, he was involved in Chicago in an attempt to bring in mm-hmm. an NASL team to somewhere in the in Chicago the, area. In the city. My best guess would be somewhere around the United Center mm-hmm. or on the North Shore. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you've ever seen a Chicago map or been to Chicago, if you're in Evanston, where Northwestern mm-hmm. is, you're not driving to Bridgeview for a soccer mm-hmm. game on a 
weeknight one and on a saturday night probably not either mm-hmm. because it can take you two hours to get from the north side to the south side mm-hmm. even through the highway system um i think that they would look they're inside like you said mm-hmm. inside the city somewhere downtown accessible uh and that'll that'll be a big blow to the chicago fire i think because that'll that'll really challenge them for the market at mm-hmm. that point and I, I think there was a little bit too much of a push from the NASL that we're this competitor, we're this rogue league that, you know, we're pushing for something different in America. I think right now the best thing that them and even Papadakis at the USL can do is recognize, like, okay, right now MLS is the big boy. They have all the super money, the big investors and the teeth. What can we do? Let's not worry about them. Mm -hmm. You know, USL, yes, they've partnered a little bit with them to work together, but still, both of those leagues have to look at it and say, let's not worry about them. What can we do to help us? Mm -hmm. And, And I think for the NASL, it's recognizing that we're not a rogue league we're a soccer league. We, we, we operate with a different salary structure mm-hmm. and ownership structure than Major League Soccer. But we are right now, we're okay being Division Two. though in my opinion, once you get past Division One in this country, it really doesn't matter because it's not like you're bouncing up and down and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and I, I don't think you're going to get a Co-D1 sanction. Um, you know, it's... How can we be the best D2 league that we mm-hmm. can be, the best minor league support system that we can be, whether that means one day you're selling your young talent to MLS or abroad or you're bringing in that next level player. Maybe MLS has gone after, let's say, the Costa Rican national team players. Well, how can you raise the level of the NASL? Maybe it's by going after Guatemalans and Salvadorians, mm-hmm. players from, say, maybe Trinidad, if you mm-hmm. want to have a little foreign flair and, you know, MLS may be moving past those 36-year-old aging stars. Well, if NASL starts getting themselves nice, decent facilities, grass, training pitches, things like that, you know, the Cosmos laid the groundwork. I mean, they almost went bankrupt doing it. But Mm -hmm. if you play your cards right as you grow, why can't you have Raul? You know, MLS is going to try to move past that because of where they're trying to take the league, what it needs to do for the national team at the end of the day. But USL and ASL, yeah, maybe they're secondary markets, but you can get that 36-year-old guy for one more go around, and he's a, you know, it could be a bigger name, and he helps you sell some jerseys. And I think that that's where their place is. It's going to be those secondary and tertiary markets that are really kind of on their way up. And, and I think once MLS gets really large again, I'd, I kind of would like to see them separate their reserve sides out of the USL. Mm-hmm. So that would allow the USL breathing room to continue to grow. Because once you get to 32 MLS teams, you can reasonably have a reserve league yeah. with 32 MLS teams. And your travel's not going to be that far. Even if you don't play everyone, you could have, say, the Northeast teams only play the, the Northeast like teams. Do in, in and you play, eight, you play everybody six times yeah you know uh, yes you see the same teams but you play everybody six mm-hmm. times and maybe have a little playoff at the end yeah. of the year but i think for the, the the lower divisions it's really important to kind of establish mm-hmm. that is we're okay being where we're at for now and i think nasl just discovered that um you know that ever since they were were founded they were gonna they were pushing to become division one we're gonna be the first division just like mls and we're gonna do it different everybody's gonna come to us uh, but the problem was they didn't really do things properly to get there. Um, some clubs overspent well beyond their means. Uh, I think they were in such a hurry to grow that they made some mistakes with some ownership. I don't think they had really kind of any rules or regulations for who they were bringing in. There was no vetting process. Oh, you want to give us money? You want to run a team? Okay. And then Rio Vallecano is it. You know, you have a... a mid to bottom table Spanish team that wants to put, uh, you know, wants to start up a, a team in your league, who forgot to ask the question, what happens if your Spanish first division team gets relegated? Because the club is small and doesn't have a lot of money anyway. So if they get relegated, what happens to the team over here? Nobody, it feels like nobody asked that question. And that was the simple question. And in the, that whole situation could have been avoided. Now, I, I like what I hear from, um, from the owner from Miami FC, who's kind of, we need to be, he kind of said, we need to be comfortable in our own skin. 
we need to recognize who we are, what we are, and we need to reconnect with everybody. I think a big problem they had this last year and a half was the whole traffic sports debacle. Uh, I don't think anybody was going to come into the league as long as traffic still had some kind of stake. And that took a very long time to extract them. I think it, it finally finished up in like October, November, where they finally separated completely uh, the remaining investment or however that was. Now that that's gone, I can see them starting to push on. Um, I think that's why, in the end, U.S. soccer was very smart with what they did. Uh, at first, I was, nah, just give it to USL, this is done. But you don't always know what's going on in the background. And I like what they did, which was we're not going to determine the big winner and the big loser because the NESL would have gone under. So they just kind of held tight a little bit. And I think that's going to benefit NASL tremendously. Um, I could see, and this is why I, I'm surprised maybe that Pierwell isn't the commissioner, but I got to think he's doing a lot of work on this expansion front, not just with Chicago. I think they put him in a position to go and, and really talk to these people who want to get involved. And I could, you can see them naming four clubs for, for next season. You can just see it happening that quick, and all of a sudden, they've got some momentum going. Where, you know, at you know, that same time this past year, they were almost dead in the water. So I'm real interested to see how all that's going to play out for them. You know, I actually had um, an interesting conversation with one of my best friends. Uh, we grew up playing soccer together since we were real little um, last week, and he he said to me, you know, Alex, what what do you think is the the topping out point in this country. I said, well, theoretically, it's limitless. But, um, you know, if you wanted to say how many professional clubs can this country support, say, 10 years from now, um, uh, I took a minute and just kind of quickly scanned the country myself, thinking about mid size markets mm -hmm. and things like that. I said, I think they could get to 100. Mm -hmm. I think that's a reasonable number that if you really think about it and you can find the investor in each of those markets, and they're not all going to be Major League Soccer type money. There's going to be, you know, some of these smaller clubs. Maybe you end up with another regional league somewhere. But uh, thinking about it, I, I started just running through my head going, you know, Syracuse. You know, Syri why can't Syri Syracuse is big enough? Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Detroit, Milwaukee, and just kind of kept going mm -hmm. from there on and on and on and, and just rattling off mm -hmm. cities in the United States and Canada to him. And he's like, if they, it's, it makes sense. And, and I think that's where the NASL and the USL really need to focus on is that, you know, give up. I don't want to say give up, but put on the shelf for now, the pipe dream, especially for the NASL, like you said, they've kind of realized this. D don't go to LA. Don't go to Philly. Don't go to DC. Virginia Beach. The yeah. Tidewater area is a very densely populated area. Um, there's a lot of mil military folks down there. There's a little bit of wealth uh, in in that region. Um, they have a they have a, a, a hockey team that they support. Um, no reason to think they can't do it. You, you look at a place like that. You you look at uh, you know some of, some of the other smaller, even smaller markets that have teams. Mm -hmm. Charleston Battery. Yeah. You know Harrisburg mm -hmm. is is not a big market, um, but they can mm -hmm. they, they've got a way to keep a small team going. And I I think if you do it right, even here in Pennsylvania with us, you know I've said well one day why why can't you have Erie, Scranton, Bethlehem having mm -hmm. their own. Um, pro teams. I know right now we have the Steel. Their, their first year was a struggle attendance-wise at the gate. Um, but if if done, you know, if done well, why can't you have teams in those cities? And I, I think the Jersey Shore could support a team where we grew up. You know, I'm not yeah. sure where you put the team, but there's one. There's over a million people in Monmouth Ocean mm -hmm. County. Yeah, I think. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because you mentioned NESL not going to LA. I imagine they're going to be in was Orange County. Um, they have somebody who wants to give it a go. I think though that's it's not LA proper. It's it's greater. L, I'll call it, we'll call it the greater LA area, like you do. You know, but I think L, LA. But I think that'll be all right down there. Well, LA is one of those places. My father's yeah. there right now. By mm -hmm. the way, we'll give him a quick shout out <laughs> to the coach in LA. He's out there for for the Academy <laughs> Awards. They got some crap. <laughs> Yeah, he sat in traffic for two and a half hours yesterday mm -hmm. to go about 10 miles. So, yeah, yeah Orange County's okay. Yeah, and I think what's important with all these clubs is to realize 
it's going to be like everywhere else. Not everybody can be a big club. It doesn't happen. It, does, it just doesn't work that way. You're going to have small clubs, and we have them now. And some of these small clubs are really good clubs, and they're run really well. And then you have some clubs that are small and try and run like their big league, and they get into trouble uh, quickly. Listen, I think we've even seen that in the NPSL. We've been around the league long enough yeah. where we've seen franchises come and go in the Keystone mm -hmm. Conference uh, and, and in the region even mm -hmm. where uh, they've, they've overspent and overshot themselves uh, mm -hmm. and, and on the other end undershot themselves too. And then, I, you know, I think uh, Binghamton, I look at them as kind of for where mm -hmm. we're at in this region here in the, the Valley, Leah Valley, in the Keystone Conference, I've always looked at them as the standard, mm -hmm. you know, but th there's, there's well-run clubs out there. Yeah, I mean, Detroit, Detroit, Detroit City, mm -hmm. there's one, you know, and they're always one that comes to mind just because of the, the different club feel that they have, you know, kind of supporter owned. I mean, they raised money. They redid their own stadium. They're expanding. They're putting in the plans to, to grow the club. You know, that's one at some point where you're going, yeah, it's too bad you need $200 million to get into the top league. But there's nothing that says that at some point that, you know, you don't get somewhat of an owner. You do that German style 51-49, 51% owned by the uh, the support 49 by somebody wants to put some money into it to raise it a level and maybe they could go pro at some point you know or they could be we're not doing that at all we're going to be more like an AFC Wimbledon or an FC United of Manchester where we're just going to stay supporter owned that's for them to decide but it doesn't mean one way is right and one way is wrong but they're doing it well for what they want to do um, because very quickly that can get away from you like you said and then you go bust so I think, I think 100 is doable. I think in the next few years, you're going to see upwards of 60. Uh, and that's, getting, that's not counting the reserve teams well, in the U.S. You, you cut those out. I you think take we'll, them out. Yeah. I think we'll be at 60. Um, I'm interested to see once the division structure gets sorted, if some of the NPSL clubs will jump up. Or, or PDL clubs will jump up to the – to the to that professional rank now you got to sign player contracts and things like that but i'll be real interested to see and i think that's more about five years from now when all this will shake out and then we'll see the next push uh probably for like division three well i think that 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 will open the door um that kind of circles back to my mls reserve argument that that mm -hmm. that then opens the door for um your Chattanoogas, your Detroit cities, your Binghamtons, mm -hmm. where they're getting, you know, three, five, in the case of Chattanooga mm -hmm. and Detroit, 10,000, mm -hmm. you know, people per game. It opens up those doors for, for those teams, I mm -hmm. think, at that point. And, and maybe they're even, as I said to, to, to you, I said to my friend, you know, maybe there's a fourth league somewhere. I don't know who whose auspices mm -hmm. it's under. Maybe it's the PDL, maybe it's the MPSL, mm -hmm. who starts that pro tier mm -hmm. um, where, you know, maybe they're only paying the guys $25,000, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's another tier of, yep. of, of soccer where it'll allow those smaller markets to form mm -hmm. regional leagues. You're professional, but you're a part-time player. You know, you're professional in the sense that you're getting paid, but you're going to have another job. Right. You're going to have to find another 15 It's grand. like being yeah. in con, you know, the conference or what they call it now, the National League in England. Some clubs are professional, others aren't. But those that are, you get paid, but that's not all they do. You know, they don't just play soccer. They actually go and do stuff a few days a week or five days a week. And they show up for training during, at night and play on the weekend, which is what, when it was the USISL, that's what USL was. Um, I worked for one of the clubs in Jersey that did that. All these guys got paid, but I can tell you, they weren't getting paid enough, not nearly enough to live on. It was almost a second fun job for them, but every guy had another job and then a few who were involved with soccer who were coaching and things like that around the state they would jump in and do the camps as well for the club so you picked up a few extra bucks um, but they were full-time with whatever club or clubs that they were training or coaching or running so I think that's where that fourth division will we'll call it will, would fall so it's maybe taking like an MPSL yes now we're gonna start paying some some players or we're going to pay everybody on, you know, that we signed to a contract, but it's only going to be 
you know, 500 bucks a game or 1,000 mm -hmm. bucks a game, you know, the understanding is, yes, you're getting paid here, but you're working as well, uh, a regular career. And nothing wrong with that. I think Jamie Vardy was doing that, too, until he, uh, he got found and worked his way up. So I think that's, that's that, going to be that fourth division, and that'll really lock it in all the way up and down. Good conversation. Uh, we've taken mm -hmm. up 40 minutes already, yeah. uh, so we should uh, we should probably take a break mm -hmm. uh, and thank some of our sponsors. Do want to welcome on uh, St. Luke's University Health Network. They'll be joining us uh, both on the television and on the podcast as a sponsor for the next year. Uh, if you live in the Lehigh Valley and you're listening to us, uh, check them out. One eight six six St. Luke's. We'll be back after this break. Welcome back to the second segment of the Corner Kick Extra for this week. We are uh, February 3rd, Friday, getting ready for the matches at the weekend. Uh, start off our trot around Europe, JJ, with the biggest one. We might as well not mess around with it. Um, which Arsenal shows up against mm -hmm. Chelsea is going to be uh, the determining factor in the Premier League title race? If it's Arsenal's... Uh, uh, Sleeping side, not good. If it's the same Arsenal that demolished Southampton, they got a shot. It's I, a long shot, yeah. but there's a shot. Um, I still echo the same points you and I talked about at the beginning of the week, that this, this week will likely determine how much more we talk about England going out the rest of the show, or if we start talking mm -hmm. about Ligue 1. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, th th this could be it. Uh, Chelsea, nine points clear of Tottenham and Arsenal. Uh, if they beat Arsenal at home, it, it puts them 12 clear of Arsenal. Depending on Tottenham's result, then it, it'd either be 9, 11, or 12 points. It's pretty much done and dusted. Um, this is the blight on Chelsea's season that they're looking for some revenge. Arsenal handled them at the Emirates pretty easily uh, earlier in the season, 3 0. Um, Will that happen again at this point? I don't think so. I, I don't, myself, I don't see Arsenal winning the game. Uh, I think Chelsea are going to win it. I think they're going to put it to bed this weekend. Um, you know, we, we talked about uh, on the show two weeks ago that if, if Chelsea got, could get four points from the Liverpool and Arsenal matches, this was probably done and dusted. Well, they got to draw. They got it away from them. Now they're coming home. Uh, I think they get the three points here. I, I just don't see them being denied by this Arsenal side. Uh, I still think they're too fragile uh, at times when it comes down to it. Um, I think Chelsea, the way that they've just been steamrolling the last few months, had one slip up, uh, and that was it. And I, I see them putting this to bed, and I think what we'll be talking about a lot in two weeks' time, and the rest of the way are going to be the Champions League spots, and not necessarily the title race. I, I happen to, you know, I agree. There's not much else really, I think, to, for me to say mm -hmm. about it. You covered it really well. Um, Arsenal isn't necessarily in the best state right now. Uh, um, Wenger seems to be in this state of, I don't have to, I shouldn't have to motivate this team. They're mm -hmm. getting paid ungodly sums of money to be here at Arsenal, and they should reach soccer zen like I have. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, I have the soccer zen. <laughs> I will sit here and we will play the soccer. I will not play. We're not paying that for him. He's too, that is too much. Yeah. We will come back in this summer. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I think realistically this is an Arsenal team that's a little banged up. Uh, Chaka's mm -hmm. suspended. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have your Wengers, long... Wenger's still... You know, up in the stands. Um, and I think you saw what happened at Watford. Um, well, home, it was home against Watford, It was home against it? Watford, yes. I think this carries over. I think the biggest problem is Wenger not being on the touchline. I think that's, that was huge when that band came down to four games. Um, and put him, uh, you know, up in the director's box or wherever he's going to sit at Stamford Bridge. Um, and to, to your other point, I think he struggles to motivate players. I really do. I, I don't. I think it's a lot different from when he took over in the the mid '90s. It's changed a lot. Teams. The player has changed, and I don't think he's adapted well enough to be able to motivate them for 36 games a season. That's why they haven't won the title in 12 years or whatever it's been. Um, you know, they are a little banged up. Xhaka missing in the middle is huge. 
But then again, if he was playing, there's a good chance he gets sent off anyway. Um, I it's think, like a magnet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think Costa's going to have a good day uh, up top with, with those Arsenal defenders. Uh, you know, I thought I, he played very well against Liverpool. Yeah. Um, during uh, during the week on on Tuesday, uh, um, Liver- could... though Liverpool in their defense, mm-hmm. they threw that one away. Uh, Firmino had two really good opportunities uh, that that he missed. Um, I know missed penalty kick for, for the chances that Liverpool had. It was a questionable had... penalty kick to begin with. I think it I was it was, it was deserved. Cut. Yeah. But it was he was you, you could make the case that Costa was going down already, but he got clipped. Um, he caught him on the leg. For me, it was a clear penalty. Um, and for the chance that Liverpool had, to me, if Costa puts that away, I thought Chelsea. A lot of people say Liverpool maybe should have won the game. I thought Chelsea should have won the game. Um, I thought the title should have been put to rest on Tuesday because uh, they would have been the extra two points with Spurs drawn and Arsenal losing would have put them 12 point or 11 points clear. We wouldn't even be worrying about Tottenham's result if Chelsea, you know, won this weekend. Um, there's, so you still have a little bit of one eye, you know, over your shoulder. But I, I think this is it. I think Costa is going to have a good game. I think Hazard's going to do something. I think they're going to shut up shop in the back. Maybe Arsenal will get one. I think it's going to end 3-0 or 3-1 to, to Chelsea. I think they get full revenge on for earlier in the season. Fair assessment. And then the only other match um, involving a team that I think realistically could catch them um, now is mm-hmm. Spurs. They have Middlesbrough at home. It is now must win here mm-hmm. for Tottenham. Failure to do so will push this out to that 11-12 mm-hmm. to 12 point mark. And I don't think Chelsea's going to turn that many points to the negative over the rest of the season, especially if you've already knocked out Poole and Arsenal yeah. in one week. I mean, Tottenham um, are the chasing club. Hurt themselves in the in the middle of the uh, week. Yeah. A, a, a draw at Sunderland 0-0 is, you know, to, the, to a last place Sunderland team who's mm-hmm. really struggling. I mean, this is a team that was rumored to be chasing Robbie Keane because they mm-hmm. needed attacking help. Yeah. Middlesbrough brought in a few players. Um, I don't think... They have some internal problems themselves. The manager wanted um, one or two other players, didn't get them. He had to go with the supporters a few weeks ago for the home support. Um, so not everything's well at the Riverside. But they always put in a tough performance. Um, you know, They haven't been rolled too many times this season. I think they'll go in there with some grit. For Tottenham, the, the only way that they can keep challenging is as long as Harry Kane is healthy. If he goes down again, it's over um, because they, there's just nobody else that can put in the goals for him. I mean, Deli Alley scored a few times here and there, but I don't think you can count on him to give you another 10 to 12 goals in the second half of the season. No, Alley on 11 right now, Kane with 13, but he's mm-hmm. he's the the man that makes it go. Yeah. Uh, very quietly, though, quickly, uh, Zlatan having... A good season. Nobody's really talked about it. The, the old man still got some life in those mm-hmm. legs. 14 goals uh, for him. Kind of keeping Manchester United in that, that Europa League race. Uh... Again, I think you know they got bit with that. They played Hull too many times in a short window. They played him three times in less than a month. Twice in the cup, once in the league. And they, except for the first one that they won, they, they drew twice. Um, they had they had some good chance. I mean, the whole keeper played out of his mind, um, but that draw hurts United. You know, keeps them sitting there in in sixth, where they could have you know another two points. Then you're looking at hey, you slip up and we win, and we're either tied or we're ahead of Liverpool or City. Now, you know, they're still two results away from getting there. Uh, you know, two slip ups. So. It, it's going to be a very fun run, and I'll tell you that. Um, for I think that that fourth spot, even you know, really any of the Champions League spots, somehow this is going to go to the title is going to be decided, and second to six is going to be a crapshoot going into the last couple months. I think that'll make it uh, an entertaining conversation, mm-hmm. at least uh, if you you take out the the Chelsea 
point, let's say he gets done this weekend, mm-hmm. uh, and and they're they're up that 11, 12 points, and it's all but done and dusted, barring a catastrophic collapse. Mm-hmm. Um, the battle for the Champions League and the Europa League automatic places will be will be really really interesting. Mm-hmm. And then on the other side of the table. Um, Leicester took a hard one, lost to Burnley, um, and all of a sudden that gap between Sunderland, Hull, and Palace, and then Middlesbrough, Leicester, and Swansea at 21 Mm -hmm. points, um, you're talking five points from last place to safety, two points from relegation to safety, so there is a lot Mm -hmm. to play for, and I think if you're Leicester fans... Do you start to get a little nervous right now because you are so close to the drop zone? They should be. They should have been all season. Um, their big, one of their biggest problems has been the performances of West Morgan and Robert Huth. They have been a shell compared to last season. Um, I mean, I've seen a, a few halves here and there of, of their matches, and West Morgan just looks lost in the middle of the park. Um, I was shocked that they didn't try and bring in, or didn't, not even tried, that they didn't bring in a center back. That's where they needed help in this transfer window. They didn't do it. Um, Their their backs that start are all over the age of 30. Simpson and Fuchs mm -hmm. are both 30, Morgan 33, Mm -hmm. and Huth is 32. For me, that's a little too old for the Premier League. And, And your other options, if you, you know, we look at the roster here, Basically, no one of any worth that's going to play. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Vasilevsky's 36 and a shell of what he was at Anderlecht five, six years mm-hmm. ago. He was a good player, but mm-hmm. you're starting to teeter on that point with Huth and Morgan now where they were good players and they had kind of that last strong push as mm-hmm. everybody went through together. Yep. And, you know, Schmeichel was standing on his head and Drinkwater came onto the, the, to the scene and these guys all kind of put it together like you've said on TV at the same time. Yeah. And they've all decided to go back to sleep. Mm-hmm. But at the same time. Yeah, Jamie Vardy got the big payday, has barely scored a goal this year. Mars has been a shell of his of himself. They really need to be careful. Their away form is absolutely dreadful. So for them to stay up, they have to start start closing the deal at home and putting some wins up and I know in uh, 2 weeks time United come to town. Um, and with the way United play, they could probably get a draw from that. Um, but they really need to start looking at what are essentially relegation six-pointers. And it's going to be a cluttered schedule as well. Mm-hmm. They're still alive in the FA Cup, have Derby, and then they're still alive in the Champions League and mm-hmm. have to take on Sevilla. So they have some serious decisions to make about what they're going to do. And that that Derby, Sevilla, is uh, those games are sandwiched in between a trip to Swansea mm-hmm. that is a game where they really need to make sure they take a point from. I think they're going to put the reserves out against Derby. Um, I think Ranieri has to make sure that they're in the Premier League next season. This is a club where if they survive this year, they probably go down next year. Um, I can, it reminds me a little bit of Blackburn Rovers in the mid-90s there. They won the Premier League, and a couple of years later, they, they fell through the trap door. I can see it happening here. Could they go down this season? Absolutely. Um, it's probably going to be, you know, it's, what, three from six, I think, right now. Bournemouth have to be careful, you know, on 26 points, but they still have a little gap there to play with where, hey, you get two wins and they'll be sitting, they'll be feeling a little bit better about themselves. But there's always a point in, in the year, and it happens every season, where a couple teams from the bottom of the table, and even that, 17th or 16th place, all of a sudden, they put a little run together, they grab five, six points, and now a few more teams get drug into it. And I think you just saw it. Palace have won, Swansea get get a few wins, Hull have won a couple games, even Sunderland with a, you know, a couple draws here or there, picked up a few points. So now they pulled you know, they pulled Leicester back into it, Middlesbrough, who looked like they might break away, have been pulled back into it. You know, and, and now Bournemouth, Watford, and even Southampton. And you can even go as high as West Ham on 28. They're not away from it yet. You lose a couple of games, and then let's just say... 40 points. Yeah, and let's say Palace and, Sw- and Swansea, and Leicester all of a sudden each win two games, and they bang six points up. All hell breaks loose again. So it's going to be very interesting the next couple of weeks on who's able to... Those teams that are a little away, who can get a little further away, get a little more breathing room. 
but I think we're hitting that point where these teams at the bottom of the table all of a sudden are going to get some points, and it's going to make it a little nervous uh, for everybody. And it'll be fun to watch uh, d- down the yeah. stretch, probably more so at the bottom and in the Champions League table than it will be for first place. Yeah. Um, shall we move forward here? Yep. Uh, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about Lega. Yeah, the the big match of the weekend, one versus two. Uh, Monaco hosting um, Nice. Uh, on Saturday, um, so that that should be a good one. Um, what we have to check is if it's on one of the B and Connect online stations, because right now I only know that it's on the French station, uh, the French language station, which I don't get. But um, you know that that'll determine first place. You know Paris Saint Germain just behind away to Dijon, they should get three points there. So this little cutter at the top is gonna going to stay there again so it, it's it's a fun race this year um you know psg i think was pushed to the wire i think maybe last year the year before it went close um you know it's very intriguing with balotelli being back for nice they could go into monaco and and get three points but like we talked about on television monaco 65 goals in 22 league matches so this could be you know, a 3-3 three, three or 4-4 four, four without batting an eye where you could get, you know, a nil-nil snore fest just as easy. But I'm anticipating some goals. Falcao picked a good year to find himself mm-hmm. once again. Yeah. Um, 12 goals, um, you know, through through the 22 matches. And this is a player who a year ago was being linked with the Columbus crew. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, not nothing against the Columbus crew, but... Major League Soccer isn't quite legal. Um, so, you know, uh, Falcao goes from being linked with a move to mm-hmm. America and Europe writing him off as a player mm-hmm. to reestablishing himself as one of the premier strikers on the continent. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's, that's big for, for Monaco. And then on the, the other side of this, you have Mario Balotelli at Nice. Nine goals, mm-hmm. only 11 matches played. Lots of suspensions, but... Um, you know, you ha- yeah. he, they, they're, they're going to have to be careful with that, too, mm-hmm. going forward. If he picks up a card, you know the second one can follow with Balotelli. Um, but um, they, they do have some some other players. Uh, Plie is uh, another good player. Mm-hmm. He's a young Frenchman, 11 goals. Uh, so there's there, there's quite a bit there for Nice. Mm-hmm. And I like, we've said on TV, there's a shake-up this year. Mm-hmm. And in Germany, there could be a shake-up. I, yeah. I like that we're actually talking about... Um, change in mm-hmm. the the top tier for once because it it does get a little bland when you're focusing on well PSG won they're up nine mm-hmm. you know Bayern won they're up nine and Juve's up nine at this point in the yeah. year and everyone is sitting there going great yeah what are we gonna watch for the rest of the year they're gonna show us this every week they're gonna win three to nothing and mm-hmm. that's gonna be that. Yeah, yeah, it's good to have a little something here to talk about, you know, especially in France because I mean PSG won what the last five, so it's refreshing to to see this. Um, you know, it's going to be a big weekend in Germany as well. Uh, you know, Bayern at, at home to Schalke. Schalke is struggling a bit this year, um, but Bayern by no means just thumping teams anymore. Um, I think they'll handle Schalke a little handily just because it's in Munich. I think they. They play uh, a little better at home than they have been on the road. Uh, but, you know, I think Bayern will take care of it. And then, you know, that's those are the early matches. And, you know, the the 12.30 match tomorrow, 12.30 Eastern time, it's the, it's extremely important to ha- what happens in the league uh, with Dortmund hosting Leipzig. Uh, a win for Dortmund would catapult them over Frankfurt temporarily mm-hmm. as they'll take on Darmstadt. Uh, you'd have to think at home Frankfurt would claim the the three off of them, but yeah. for Leipzig, once again they are they are backs to the wall because mm-hmm. if they want to hold pace with Bayern, they have to score a victory. Mm-hmm. A draw will not do in this game. Um, I think uh, with, with you, I think Bayern handles Schalke at home. So again, this is one of those decisive moments mm-hmm. where if Leipzig fails to defeat Dortmund and Bayern wins, mm-hmm. you may put. Germany on ice and I know we just said it's nice that it's been exciting but it could go on ice this weekend yeah and six points by no means is it over because what we you know what we talk about on, on TV especially with 
Bayern having those Champions League games coming up, and you figure they'll probably get through Arsenal, have another set, uh, and they could fall around some bigger some bigger games where all Leipzig is focused on is the league. But it does make it where Bayern have to slip up twice. Or at least once, Leipzig have to be perfect and then beat Bayern at the end of the season at home um, to to have a shot at, at the title. Um, I think the starting 11 will, will tell Dortmund's starting 11 because what we come to learn is if Pulisic starts, Dortmund usually win. Sometimes they'll draw, but they rarely lose. They're if, much better with if him. If Pulisic is on the bench like he was last weekend... You know, it, it, it becomes tougher for them. Don't know why, but for some reason when he's in the starting 11, their results are better. Um, I anticipate he'll start. Um, I think that's going to be one hell of a match. I am thrilled with the TV lineup this weekend, or, or tomorrow especially, because Chelsea Arsenal are 7.30. Um, it, you know, Monaco and Nice are at 11, depending on if we can find it. And then 12.30... Dortmund and Leipzig. So there's only a little overlap between, you know, the the French game and the German game, but it's not like Arsenal and Chelsea are at, you know, the 12:30 kickoff and we've got two big games, you know, going up against each other. No, We're Arsenal, be able to Arsenal enjoy them all. Arsenal's the alarm game. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, if you're on the East Coast at least and if you're listening on the West Coast, just don't go to bed. Yeah, just make it a longer drinking night. You, know, that's you, all you, fig- you figure do. something out. Yeah. Um, but it, it <laughs> And I, I, I think um, team to watch going forward here, and said it on Monday, for me, is the rapid demise of Hertha Berlin. This is a team that's lost four out of five mm-hmm. um, and is really in free fall mode. And another poor result this weekend would see them tumble out of the automatic spots, um, uh, coupled with a Cologne win, who they take on Wolfsburg mm-hmm. at home. Um, so they're they're in a, a very very difficult position right now, and mm-hmm. I think you have to watch them the rest of the year because they could fall back to the pack pretty quickly. Yeah, um, it's been a tough go for them. Luckily, I, I'd say they're playing English Stadt at home. The English Stadt having their own troubles this season, but you know it, it doesn't mean that they're not good enough to grab a point with the way Hearth has been playing, or even the three away from home, but. I have a feeling Hearth is going to get it. I think they're going to stop the slide here, um, at least for a week. At least for a week. Um, and then we'll see what happens going forward. But, you know, it would be nice if, uh, if you know, they can turn the ship around a little bit, uh, you know, and kind of hang into the European spot, especially for John Brooks. I think, uh, yeah, for his benefit, if they can make the Europa League to get him some extra matches as Americans, I mm-hmm. think we want to see that, that our guys are getting that, um, you know, that extra run out. Um do you have any other topics that you personally would like to touch on here? Because we're we're getting close to uh, kind of the end of our our podcast for for this week. I'm not sure if there's any other uh, leagues you'd like to touch on, any other kind of news you'd like to be be touching on, uh, or or is this kind of where you want to start winding it down? I think um, I think we're we put in a good shift for Friday. Um, so, you know, I'm good wrapping it up here. I think we hit uh, the major points uh, with MLS because I think expansion was just such a big topic this week um, because we're still a few weeks away from the important, you know, uh, kickoff. I mean, tomorrow is, is one month from the first game of the season. So, um, you know, and preseason's just starting up, you know, some injury news here and there. I mean, the Red Bulls have a little bit with Grella having a, a quick knee surgery, Kamar going down with a groin. But, you know, thankfully, throughout the league, nobody's had the big injury in the preseason. I hope it stays like that um, because it's just going to make everything a little more entertaining once the season starts. Start building towards Champions League a little bit as well mm-hmm. um, next week because we'll be, we'll be getting closer to, to that date. Yeah. Obviously, we'll be at Red Bull Arena uh, <laughs> for, uh, for the ice bucket ball. Um, but I'm looking forward to, to getting started with Major League Soccer mm-hmm. um, and just give us some, uh, some more kind of diversity into, uh, into our lineup, especially it could be good if Chelsea wins this weekend because this kind of could put the Premier League to rest and uh, mm-hmm. we'll be able to kind of dedicate a little bit more towards mm-hmm. the domestic game. Yeah, yeah hopefully have that and maybe a little, little more news out of what's going on with uh, Red Bulls behind the scenes. Uh, some interesting things all over the place with them uh you know 
Ollie Curtis has disappeared like Precky disappeared. I wonder if he went to wherever Precky was staying the last three years until he got found again. So it'll be interesting to keep tabs on that. But, you know, there could be some, some turmoil with that club this season. So it's definitely going to be something that I imagine next few weeks we're going to be talking about a bit more. All right. Um, that'll do it for us here. Corner Kick Extra, Alex Fidrashevsky and J.J. Pepe. Um, you can catch us on CWTAP on Service Electric in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania, channel 126, Monday nights at 8 o'clock. It also streams online. The link is there uh, on the screen in front of you, and it's also linked in the YouTube title, so you can click and watch us live anytime, anywhere in the world. Uh, JJ, thank you for coming in today. Uh, it's good to be here, and uh, we'll see everybody next week. All right, God bless, and uh, we'll catch you next week, folks.